So here we have another email from one of my subscribers who goes by the name of Daniel. Now, even though Daniel is wrong in his email, he still poses a position that if answered correctly, could help a lot of people. So thank you, Daniel, for the email. Now, I'm going to read his email and then respond to the email after. So his email reads, Hello, Mr. Thompson. I have, I have a question to ask you. It may be foolish, but I will ask it nevertheless. What hope is there for a lost sinner who clings to the Calvinistic doctrine that God might be doing a regenerating work to his or herself? I also have another question. A sinner can't truly repent in the heart if God has not wrought change in that heart. Therefore, my question is, should the sinner still forsake his way? If the sinner cannot also obey and heed the word as the regenerated man can, should the sinner still try to do so? Even if it is to do the right thing, I am sorry for the silly questions, but I am curious to what your biblical stance is for these questions. Thank you and God bless. So thank you, Daniel, for the email. Thank you. Now, one of the worst things a professing Christian can do is to get the doctrine of Calvinism wrong, to go hyper with it. Tim Conway has a whole series, a wonderful series, on when Calvinism goes bad. And for Daniel and many of my subscribers, it has gone bad. Okay, This enlarges exactly why I do not like talking about Calvinism with new converts. But there is good news, and that good news is that it doesn't have to stay bad. So with that video, so with this video, I'm going to explain how taking Calvinism hyper expresses the pride and arrogance of the sinner. Let's look at the first part of Daniel's email. He says, a sinner can't truly repent in his heart if God has not wrought change in that heart. Therefore, my question is, should the, sinner, should the sinner still forsake his way? If the sinner cannot also obey and heed the word as the regenerated man can, should the sinner still try to do so? Okay, even if it is to do the right thing. See, you see what he's doing there? I want you all to listen, listen to me very clearly. Hear me loud. What Daniel just did here is he placed fault with God and his sovereignty. Let me say that again. What Daniel and people like him do when they butcher Calvinism is they try to place fault with God and his sovereignty. He's using the sovereignty of God as a scapegoat. Listen to me clearly. On the day of judgment, as you stand before the Lord naked, well, God, I wasn't elect. You didn't draw me to you. That's not going to cut it. That excuse won't work. You will depart and you will go to hell. Understand this. This is what you all need to understand. This is not about Calvinism. And I'm one of the biggest Calvinists on YouTube. This is not about wondering if I'm in or from out, if I'm elect or non-elect, if God is drawing me in or not. This is about, are you needy? Are you thirsty? Are you sick? Jesus Christ walked this earth as a man, fully man and fully God, fulfilled the law of God by never breaking it, went to the cross, died, shed his blood and rose from the grave so that you could wonder if you were elect or not. No, no. Jesus Christ died for sinners. Here's the question. Are you a sinner? If yes, then cry out to him and continue to cry out to him until he saves you. You think I knew what Calvinism was the day I cried out to the Lord in my apartment 12 years ago? No, I didn't. I just knew that if he didn't save me, I was going down. This is why most of the time, while God, while God is drawing you to his son, he breaks you by crushing, crushing all your confidences. Okay, He takes and takes from you until the only option you have is to look up at him. See, the problem with most of you is that you are still too strong. You haven't recognized your weakness. You're not broken. You haven't come to the end of yourself by recognizing what the word of God says about you. Cry out to God every day until he saves you. This is my advice to you. Cry out to the Lord every day until he saves you. Plead your case. Lord, you sent your son to die for sinners. Lord, I'm a sinner. And if you don't save me, I'm going to hell. I deserve to go to hell. But, oh, Lord, give me what I do not deserve. Your grace and your mercy. Save me, O oh Lord. You got two options, and this is how I'm going to end this video. Either cry out to the Lord to save you until he saves you, or die and go to hell. That's it. Fourth indictment, an ignorance of the doctrine of regeneration. An ignorance of the doctrine of regeneration. My dear friend, and I'm going to say this bluntly, I know that there are Calvinists here, and I know that there are Arminians here, and I know that there are all sorts of strange animals in between. <laughs> but I want you to know this. Although I am leaning more toward, I, I guess I call myself a five-point Spurgeonist, I want you to know this. Calvinism is not the issue. 
No, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble when this goes on the internet. <laughs> Calvinism is not the issue. I'll tell you what the issue is. Regeneration. And that is why I can have fellowship with Wesley and Ravenhill and Tozer and all the rest. Because regardless of where they stood on the other issue, they believed that salvation could not be manipulated by the preacher. That it was a magnificent work of the power of Almighty God. And with them, therefore, I stand. That it was a work of God. There is a greater manifestation of the power of God in the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit than in the creation of the world, of the universe, because He created the world ex nihilo, out of nothing, but He recreates a man out of a corrupt mass. It is paralleled with the very resurrection of our Savior from the dead.